welcome and thank you for joining us on episode of 15 of the Welcome Home podcast, where we talk about the transformation from troops and boots to veterans in the civilian world. I'm Andy Wines. He's Dylan Sessler. Today and every week, we get into a topic when it comes to what that looks like and how can we best give out the best information to reduce the amount of time, effort, and energy it takes during that transformational process. So Dylan, what do you want to talk about this week? Well, one one really interesting statistic I recently found was 40.7% of veterans feel like a guest in their own home. And mm-hmm. then on top of that, I also had a conversation over the weekend. I had drill, um, and I sat up in a tower, and I talked to people uh, as OIC because um, mm-hmm. that's always fun. But I talked to a veteran who <laughs> had gotten back from Afghanistan in 2020 and talked about basically the same thing. Like the, like he was he was – expressing how he came home and went straight into the dad role uh mm. stay at home dad uh you know his wife was was bringing in bringing in the money so he just fell into that role um and we talked about just how how difficult that transition was stepping into that role after just being in Afghanistan and and trying to turn off all of the programming that he had you know pre-built for Afghanistan and, and what was happening there. Um, and I thought that would be a really interesting conversation for us to have and, and to just explore because I'm, you know, I know we've both been there and I've, I've definitely felt it. I'm sure you have. So yeah. what, what are your yeah, thoughts? I, oh, no, no. It, it's, it's, it, <laughs> this, this is why I love this podcast already because when I got back from Iraq in 2007, so 16 years ago already, I right. I went through the TAPS program, which was like a half a day of, hey, go back and get a job and you know enjoy your life, and then you don't know what you're going through. You 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 know it. It's not what the book told you. You know it doesn't feel right, and then you figure it out. And you have some really good stories and a couple good jokes out of it. And now you're telling me, you know what? Forty. Let's call it forty one percent of veterans don't feel at home. Um, I failed at this both times I came home. So. <laughs> For, that's it. So, hell yeah. First time, I, yeah, like that, like that, like that's first thing I think. I was like, yeah, I fucking checked that box like a mother, right? So here's here's what happened. First deployment, before I left for deployment, I had a girlfriend and a roommate and an apartment and a cat, and sneakers was the name of the cat, and it's relevant to the story. And uh, yes, I volunteered to go uh, overseas to go to Iraq, and our apartment lease was up. In like May, call it May June, right? So I um, I paid out like when I, my first couple months, I like paid out the the rent, and then like my girlfriend at the time and my roommate, like they were both going to rent, uh, move. Like this is my third apartment I lived in, in like three years or fourth apartment. Like every year, I was one of those people that like you got an apartment, you signed a one year lease, and then you moved every year because you could. Right? Like the idea of like an apartment more than a year was so foreign to me. So it was like the third or fourth place I lived post high school. No, it was the third place. Um, anyway, so I, I deployed, they moved girlfriend. Uh, I broke up with her cause she was hanging out with some dude. We all know how that goes. I came back. She was engaged. He was a Marine too. And he looked just like me, which was interesting because one of, uh, my brother's buddies went up to this guy at a restaurant and was like, Oh, Andy, I didn't know where you're home. And the guy, I don't recall his name was like, uh, I'm actually not Andy. And it was like the restaurant in town, the Odyssey of Manami Falls I used to go to. Uh, so Shame on that guy, right? It's funny, Awkward. whatever. And you know what? They got engaged and then married and then divorced. So uh, at, at least I avoided the ring, whatever. Okay, so I get back home, and here's what's interesting. When I was gone, my girlfriend moved they moved with my roommate into another apartment, like a, a crappier apartment. And she wanted to go move in with her new fiancé, Right and didn't want to break the lease. My my old roommate couldn't afford it, so I was like, "Fuck it, I'll just move in." Right, and she ended up taking my Dewalt drill and the cat, and and the batteries out of the TV remote because she said, and I quote, "I paid for them." So like, she basically borrowed my shit for a year and then took the goods. She took the cat, she took the drill, she took the batteries out of the remote. I know. I had a 32 inch Sony Trinitron TV back in the day. Like that TV was, it was like my pride position because that, that's what you have when you're 21. And yeah, right. so I moved in with my roommate in this crap apartment in Manami Falls, which also was in walking distance of like four or five bars, including a bowling alley bar. 
Um, that was my place. I used to, you know, that was my whatever. So for the six first six weeks I was home, I was like, oh, dude, I got 90 days before I have to go back to work. Like, I'm getting after it. So I did. And I spent my deployment money at the bars. And then I went back to my job, J-O-B. I worked for Black & Decker uh, and DeWalt Tools. So I went back there in June. And within two months, I'm like, I can't tell you how much I don't care. And so, like, I remember the first month I was in the apartment, I didn't even sleep in the bed. Like, I threw a bag on the bed and never slept on it. Because I slept on the couch. I slept on the floor. I slept at random people's houses. Like, wherever I passed out, like, that's where I slept. And I never, like, that apartment was a place for me to put my shit down. And, like... Yeah. Maybe, like, it took me, like, two months before I, like, made the bed. Because she took the bedding. So, like, I just never made the bed. Like, I slept on it a handful of times without sheets because you're just whatever. Um, right. And it was also an upper apartment without air conditioning because, again, it was kind of shitty. And it was in the summer. And then mid-August, my buddy's band was leaving for tour. Uh, and I was like, fuck it. I gave away everything. And I moved whatever possessions I had left. It was basically, like, a bed, two couches, and a TV and my clothes, I moved into my buddy's mom's basement crawl space. And then that was in August, and I bought a house the following August. I spent the next year touring the country with the band because it wasn't my apartment. I didn't want to work the job I had. I didn't want to be in my hometown. I didn't want to go to college. I didn't want an adult. And I also wanted to go back to Iraq and not go back to Iraq because it was like, well, I didn't die there's more to life than selling fucking drills in a Home Depot. To, and I couldn't make sense of it, you know? And I thought, yeah. oh, I'm just like, screw it, I'm partying. I got like no restrictions. And 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 I did it, and I had a good time. And then I came back home. I started to work for my dad's company because I still didn't know how to get a job. Like, I was 23 years old, 24 at that point, And I didn't really know how to adult. And then I bought a house and turned into my home. And I bought a house, so I got home in May of seven. And I bought a house in August of eight. So it's like 15 months of fucking around before I bought a house. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to make this house. And then right then life happened and girlfriend left and roommate left and I lost my job with my dad's company and yada, yada. Right. So like I absolutely hear what you're saying, right? 15 months. The, the challenge I had on the next deployment was my then wife moved. Uh, we sold our house. And she moved right before I um, deployed, and then she moved in the middle of my deployment. So the place she was living, I never been to before. I never seen before. I never been there before. She moved. We lived in Milwaukee. She moved to Indianapolis right before I deployed. I spent two weekends there, and then I deployed out of Wisconsin with a reserve unit. And then I got back home, and she was living in Peoria. And I remember right, I flew home from Gitmo, whatever. We had our like dismiss ceremony, which was complete bullshit. Is stupid. And then I stayed at a buddy's house that night with her and our and our daughter. And then we drove to Peoria and I just was like I walked in and I'm like, Yeah, this isn't my house. This isn't my home. This is your place. And and then in the course of three weeks, like I didn't have a job. I'm stuck in this house that wasn't mine. And I was like, Yeah, I'm the fuck out of here. And she had threatened divorce and I finally took her up on the offer. I'm like, sounds good. Like I don't want to be here. Like I remember I had to Google how to get to a Chipotle. And, and also like, that's when voice to text came out and mm -hmm. I didn't know how to, like I had, I went from like basically a flip phone to a smartphone and my brain like couldn't rack it. Like I couldn't figure that out. And then I came back to Wisconsin and my parents had been flipping a house. It was, it was pretty evident that I was going to get divorced after I came back home. So my parents were flipping a house up in Jackson, Wisconsin, which is in the middle of nowhere. And my house wasn't like in town. It was outside of town. And I remember thinking like, it was like a half hour away from where I lived. Really, it was like 17 minutes. In my head, it was a half hour. And I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to live in this place for a year. It's like basically a cabin in the woods. I'm not even going to move in all the way. So I finished remodeling it. I moved like the same two couches that I had years and years previous. And my I actually bought a bed. I bought appliances. I bought my daughter a bed. And then that was it. It was like two couches, a coffee table, my bed, and my daughter had a bedroom set. And I'm like, okay. This is just where I live. And I'm like, I'm going to be here a year or two max. Seven years of being in that house. And of all the people that came and went, um, you know, people I dated or I had a couple of buddies that lived with me and I had a, like a mother-in-law suite. Like it took me until I moved for me like, oh, that was my home. Like I was still in this very temporary mindset. Like, oh no, this is just, 
This is the place I stay after deployments. And so, <laughs> and now, finally, it's 2013. I haven't done any real army, army shit to speak of since the, since the pandemic. Like, I haven't been gone for more than like a week or two. You know, no major schools, no major nothing in three years. And last year I bought a house where I'm like, okay, this is my home. I rem- I'm, I'm in the middle of remodeling it. And like, it's going to be my place for my daughter and I to live. And my daughter's almost nine. She's going to be nine next week. And she was 18 months old when I got back home. And living in Jackson was always this like temporary place. And I had no reason. Like, I didn't have pets or kids or, or a wife that were there like 24 seven, like maintaining the house. I just, I just don't have like this, this, this sense of base. I have this sense of, well, I, let me, I want to get on a plane and go somewhere again. And that, that's like my itch to not get stuck and, and, you know, die slowly, I guess. I don't know. That's the way I interpreted it. Yeah. I, I mean, so many relatable feelings. I, I didn't grow up until after my first deployment, and I, I would say almost even until after that. Um, I deployed in 2012. I was about 22 when, when we deployed. Um, and I was going to college before that, so I was basically, you know, living in a, an apartment in Green Bay. Uh, and when I came home, it was just like all I, all I wanted to do was live out of a bag which is like, it's obviously you said the same thing. It's like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't care about like having a home base. It's in, and it's so interesting that like, you, you know, how you're telling the story is just like so similar. I'm like, I'm comfortable living out of a bag. And I would say even up until probably 2000, probably even 20, 2021, um, I was okay with it, right? Like my wife bought this house for us while I was uh, deployed in Afghanistan in 2019 uh, in in like October or September, October 2019. And I came back to it in December of 2019. And I was like, this is our, this is our home, right? And this I'm like, residence. It's, it's nice, yeah. <laughs> right? This is nice. Um, and, and so like I've settled in obviously, but like, I don't think I really settled back into it until after I finished COVID orders in 2020, 2021 ish, um, where I looked at this house and I said, I could be here for 10 years. Right. And, and to like, up until that point, I hadn't really taken out like certain bags. Cause I was just like, eh, eh. like it just doesn't feel, it feels weird. You know, like when you actually settle in, it's like, go for it. Oh, no, I, oh, you just, you, you said something that triggered me. You're like, Hey, I didn't feel it until recently. (laughs) Here's the deal. I hit night. No, here's what's no, I'm not there yet. (laughs) I can honestly say I'm not there yet. And I have the stats to prove it. Here, here's my proof that I'm not there yet. Um, I hit 19 years in the army yesterday. I'm 39 years old. I have lived the last four months in my warehouse. I moved into my warehouse two days after the new year because I started gutting my house. And people are like, you know, whenever I talk to people, they're like, oh, remodeling projects are the worst and da, da, da. And like even people are like, oh, you must be sick of it. I was like, I, I don't care. I wake up, I spend my weekends in my warehouse and it doesn't bother yeah. me at all. I've been living out of one dresser, the same five outfits, one pair of jeans, two pairs of shoes. It doesn't bother me. Also, when we first started this, no, when we when you and I first started shooting content before this podcast, I was in a relationship uh, with a woman who lived like two hours away from my house, and I say from my house because it's like a little bit closer from my warehouse, like ninety minutes if I'm if I'm going pretty quick in Chicago, and like three out of four weekends every month I was driving down there, and so basically I was using my house as a place to sleep after volleyball and do laundry, because I would drive up on Mondays from Chicago. I would work. Monday night was always my late night doing content. I have this podcast and another podcast I used to do and whatever. I used to do that one at night. Tuesday and Wednesday, I would play volleyball at night. And then Thursday, sometimes I would drive to Chicago or I would like do networking events on Thursday. And then I would either drive on Thursday night or Friday afternoon back to Chicago. Like three out of four weekends. And typically the only weekends I didn't drive to Chicago was when I had drill 
or when I had my daughter and we were up here and we didn't like there was a couple weekends we spent the weekend in Chicago. I got to the point where all I did was I I would dump my my carry on bag because I just took a carry on bag down there like I don't even mess around. It wasn't even like oh I'm packing a backpack. No fuck that. I'm carrying like a full on carry on bag. And then when mm-hmm. I traveled for work, she lived 20 minutes from O'Hare. I would just go to her house, drop my Jeep off, and then, or she would hop in my Jeep, and I'd go travel for three, four days for work, and she would drive my Jeep around. There was a period in September and October, I was at my physical house like eight days in the course of like five weeks. <laughs> and I did, and I'm like, this is normal to me. Like, I, why, why wouldn't I want this life? And yep. and so, and that's one of the strengths. I want to lean in on this. Like, okay. A lot of people are like, oh, you can, you can twist statistics, whatever you want. But it's like, well, 21 or 41% of vets don't feel at home. It's like, well, okay, how do you use it as a strength? There's a reason why veterans end up being, uh, you know, over-the-road truck drivers or traveling positions or c- government contracting jobs where they're gone for months on end. Uh, the, one of the guys, so last week when you had a, you couldn't make it, we ended up doing the podcast. And uh, I had my buddy, uh, Travis Johnson, who's, who's a podcast host, fill in for you. And the guy we talked yeah. to there was like, Hey, I want surveyors that can spend weeks, you know, months and possibly years, um, you know, building bridges and stuff. And I was like, oh, veterans would be all over that because yeah. when, when you're like, oh, it changes every couple of months or years. It's like, oh, that's normal. And you think about vets that are, you know, guys that do like 25 years with like 22 moves, just ridiculous stats. Like they're so not used to having a home. And right. so that's a great strength is I meet other people. I go to the bars in my hometown, Menominee Falls or Costco. And I'd run into people I went to high school with that. Costco. Co- I love Costco. I went to Costco the other day in Pewaukee, which is like not my, that's not my normal Costco, right? I was living on the edge. And I needed snacks. We're, we're having a, well, here's the deal. We were having a spades night at my buddy Tyler's place. And of course it's seven, six, seven vets, all of us veterans. Cause that's the only time you can find people that play spades. And uh, <laughs> I went to the Costco. I ran into three different people I went to high school with. And I'm like, man, that's fucking weird. And I would argue, I didn't ask, but I would argue they haven't left the area ever. It's like, yeah, you know, I spent a year in Iraq. I spent a year in Gitmo. I spent a year touring the country. I spent a month in Australia. I, I get on planes on a regular basis to go do the thing. Like, I'm going to be gone for two weeks here. Like, so case in point, here, here, here's another thing. God, this is such a good fucking point. I am leaving. It is, it's a good point because it's like, why am I the way I am? Let's fucking dissect Andy's life and make it so he's not the <laughs> fucked up one. I'm I'm a stat, right? It's funnier when I'm a stat than it is like I'm an anomaly, right? But here's what's jacked up. So I'm going to I'm going to New Orleans next week, and I'm there Monday through Thursday, and then I get to be in Nashville on Monday of the following week. And I was looking at, it, I was like, okay, I'm going to fly home Thursday night. I'm going to work Friday. And probably Saturday, Sunday, and then I'm gonna fly out again on Monday. And in my head, I'm like, why should I fly home? Like, what is there for me? My daughter's not here this weekend. What is there for me that has me like I need to fly home? Why? So I can sleep in my own fucking bed? No. So I'm flying down to New Orleans. I'm getting a rental car on Thursday, and I'm gonna drive. I have to be in Nashville Monday night for like a dinner, and then Tuesday morning we're um we're shooting some some content for uh, uh some paid stuff i'm getting paid no big deal i'm getting paid to shoot content that's that's when you feel like you made it like people are going to pay me mm-hmm. to do shit i do for free that's the definition yeah. of fucking making it let me tell you something right. anyhow right hey so this is what i'm going to do i'm going to get a rental in new orleans and i'm going to end up in nashville by monday night that's what's happening i already like i've never been to uh mobile alabama might go there uh i might go to tupelo mississippi it's one of my favorite places I, it's just randomly weirdly i like the place I've never spent real time in Birmingham. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do for those four or five days. I know I got a Ford Escape and a good fucking attitude. And I'm good with that. Like, that would give so many other people anxiety. I'm like, I don't know. Like, why would I want to come home? Like, so I can look yeah. at the shit I've seen every fucking weekend for the last seven years, eight years? Like, no. Let's go see the fucking world. And it feels good. It feels like, man, I got the fucking rolled by the balls. Ain't nobody can tell me to slow down. Let's fucking go. <laughs> I, See, this is... I I kind of I kind of fit both sides of it now, like I'm yeah because you got a I'm wife and a kid and yeah right. ooh, comfortable. I'm comfortable I hate that word I'm I'm comfortable here I I like hold, I like where I'm at but okay, at the same hold on, time hold on. like I want to pick that apart before you even finish the sentence are you comfortable or are you content I'm comfortable okay it's because it's 
I mean, I'm I'm content. I mean that that's a well. If you want to if you want to phase it up, I'm content. But I'm also I'm at a level of comfort where I would I would not enjoy trying to move everything and and find a place that may work better. And and maybe it does, but, but I wouldn't but you enjoy need to be there. But but you need to be there to be comfortable. Like, that's that's the way I interpreted that stat. Not that like you are always moving with all your possessions. More that. All your possessions and the wife and the, the house and the domicile are there. And you can exit that place and you feel just as comfortable, if you want to use that word, there as you do other places or content. I, I Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable here. And one of the reasons is that we've built this place to be what we want it to be, right? Like we've put mm. in the patio, like we've put in the appliances that have like – like we our dryer like I've ripped apart our dryer and cleaned out like the entire thing because it was back filled with you know uh dust and lint from 20 years of use uh you know I I put in the washer like I've I've put, I've done this stuff and I recognize that me being here with my family brings me comfort it brings me joy it brings me a recognition that I want to be here mm. uh a lot like i i really enjoy like especially now like i'm i'm daddy daycare for my my almost 11 month old i love it right yeah but prior to maybe 2021 i still live with the fucking infantry mindset of like hey you leave your bag packed right even if you sleep you lay, you, you pack your bag <laughs> like like no, no, i no. yeah <laughs> you like that's that's one of the first things that i was taught in 2009 by god who was it uh, Sergeant Laux, and I, I i don't even know if he's alive, but if he is, I mean, I, I think I remember you teaching me this. He was my first team leader. Um, Laux and then Storms, and Storms was phenomenal. They taught me that before you go to bed, you pack everything up except your sleeping bag, and, and it's ready to go. And the only thing you have to do in the morning is you stuff your sleeping bag in, close the flap, and get moving. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Right? And... and that is the the life of an instrument in the field and to this day i've i've always done that right if i'm in the field it, my my sleeping bag is ready to get packed up pop in and i'm moving um you know and and i lived with that mentality up until 2021 and even you know i still have that mentality i just use it differently um i i love traveling um honestly i i do the, i do my best writing because I'm a I'm a writer, you know. I've written a book. I've written other things. Uh, I write poetry. I do my best writing when I'm traveling. But I've learned that it is it is okay to be comfortable, and I like that. Like I really love being with my family and being comfortable here. And if we were to ever move, I wouldn't be I wouldn't have a problem with it. But I love what we, my wife and I, and and my son and my daughter we've what we've built here um and so it's it's a really interesting i think i'm transitioning away from where i used to be and i think obviously you're recognizing that you don't have to transition out of that so it's it's really interesting to kind of see where where the differences are right now between us yeah so uh what's interesting first uh a joke to be made because we got to keep things light for all you Billy Badass veterans out there, they're like, I'm going to fucking do something. Yeah, you know what you're going to do? You're going to clean your fucking dryer out someday and talk about it on a podcast. Because that's what goddamn hardcore – that's what success is someday. That is when Fuck you know yeah, you made it. I had to write that down. I have my notepad to write things down. Um, <laughs> to your point, I keep my bag packed, right? No. I, I like When I was talking about dating that woman, I would do laundry and I would just repack at all times. And even uh, recently – um, I went somewhere where I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to come home tonight. So I packed a bag, right? Like I packed for a couple days, like kind of if I leave my house, because we don't know where, I don't know where the night's going to take me. And and even to that end, um, uh, when you're talking about writing, one of the reasons I also know that it's best for me to stay gone for a bit, um, is one thing that I haven't done in a while that I, that I enjoyed doing was, um, in their army reserves, it's one week in a month, two weeks a year. And that's not exactly true. There's plenty of years that I was gone for six, eight weeks up, upwards, mm -hmm. you know? 
um, because you go to this school and then you go to that school or you go to annual training and a school and, you know, it's, it's two weeks here, three weeks there, another week-long school here, or like a fielding, whatever. Um, I realized, maybe last year or the year before that, I hadn't left in like two years because schools were canceled in 2020. Yep. I didn't go to any schools or annual training in 21. And when we did go to annual training, it was like, it was a week. So it was like, you travel on Monday, I'm home by Friday afternoon. It wasn't enough for me to be like, oh, I'm not coming home on the weekend. And that's another reason why I'm doing this trip. I, I did this uh, a couple months ago when I went from Phoenix to LA for the weekend. I need a couple days in my life where I'm not allowed to go to work. And and I have these things constrained. Like you talk about, um, you're a writer. I, I, I'm... I have three keynote speeches that I've wrote in some capacity and two of them that I've given. And there's a third one that's going to be coming out with my book. That's when I do my best work because mm -hmm. I am so far out of quote unquote comfort zone. So that's why that's one of the reasons I asked the word comfort, right? So in my hierarchy, it is content means you're, you're good with what you have and, and, and you're not missing, right? I hate the word fucking missing, but you're content. You're like, you know what? This is the life I have. I'm content comfortable is when you stop putting forth the effort to you know improve your fighting position from my perspective and then complacent is when you've really you from my perspective given up you're like there is no right and that's why i don't like the word comfortable for me because when i get comfortable i get fat and i get lazy right pt bartum said it right uh uh, uh what, what uh is it fuck i don't want to i want to fuck it up uh, but he, to, to the to the effect, it is uh, as we learn the most when we're uncomfortable. I got to look up the exact quote, and, it, and 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 that's the goal. It's like in this case, it's like, am I comfortable flying down to Nashville, renting a car, and not knowing where I'm staying? No, I'm not comfortable, and yet I'm content that I'll find a place to put my head down at night because I'm a smart enough guy and I will figure the fuck out, right? And that risk is interesting, and that mm -hmm. risk is what's going to create. Uh, an environment where my creative juices are going to flow. And so when you start to say comfortable, and there's a certain thing. The other thing that popped in my head is when you talk about your kids, I think about the end of Lord of the Rings, because I'm a sucker for Lord of the Rings. This is the greatest trilogy ever. Fight me on that one. Um, nope. I won't. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, right? It is. Because it, 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 it ends. The story ends. We're good. Like, no more. We yep. don't need nine fucking movies to get to the point. And I never watched the Hobbit shit because whatever. I saw the OGs and they were good. Anyways, at the end, Samwise Gamgee, played by Sean Astin, his greatest role ever was Rudy. I don't give a shit what anybody says. That was my yeah. generation, Sean Astin. Anyways, um, he comes home and like he hugs his wife and kids. Like he's really in that movie. Uh, Frodo is not the hero; it's Samwise because he there was nothing. He had no skill. Other than being a good friend and loyal. There was no other thing he possessed. And he's really what the movie's about. When you when you go back and it's like, he got to the end yep. and he hugs the wife and the kids and they do the little weird smile and they go in their hobbit hole. And it's like, that's where I see you. Like, you figured it the fuck out. And, and I'm some other character that's like, well, this journey's done. Where's the next one? You know, like, I'm not. And and maybe I'll never be. I, I, I often think about uh, two movies in particular. The Wrestler with Missy, Mickey Rourke. And uh, Crazy Heart with uh, Jeff Bridges, uh, the dude, if you will. 25th anniversary of Le uh, The Big Lebowski. I went and saw it in theaters last week. No big deal. Overpriced. I, I overpaid to go watch a movie I can watch at home for free to say I watched in the theater with other people. And uh, we definitely achieved. We went out and achieved anyways. Anyhow, um, the reason I think about those two movies, in particular, have you seen either one, Crazy Heart or The Wrestler? I've probably seen parts. I haven't. I don't think I've watched the okay. whole ones of both. In both movies, the 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 male main character were very successful in their craft. The wrestler, obviously, Mickey Rourke was a wrestler, and Crazy Heart Jeff Bridges was a country music star. And they got to a point when they're in their, I'll be it fifties or sixties, and they were still doing it. They were still doing their craft at a much lower level than they were at some point. And both of them had estranged kids. One uh, in wrestler was a daughter, and Crazy Art was a son. And like they put everything into their craft that they had failed relationships with women and with their kids because they it was like they were constantly chasing the next thing. And when I was at my lowest and and really beating myself up, I'd often think about those movies and be like, man, I don't want that. I don't want to put myself in a position 
where it's either in the military, you know, when I was possibly going to chase some more deployments, or in the in the civilian world where I'm chasing my craft where my daughter doesn't know me and I have nothing to show for it. And I'm not talking about a million dollar house, but something to show for it, like, hey, I built a life that uh, surrounded by good people and, 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 a, and a healthy relationship with my kid. And I have some level of freedom, you know, um, financial freedom, what it may be. And it's like, that is the thing that drives me is the idea that I, I don't want to be fucking Sam wise. I, I have no desire just to be like, okay, I'm done happily ever after. Like I want to keep chasing. And yet I also don't want to be the guy that chases to a point where he loses it all. And now I wonder if that's one of the reasons why we joined the military in the first place, right? We, we raise our right hand. We write that blank check to the government. We're like, Hey, what's cool is cool. Right? Like, hey, we'll figure it out, you know, versus the people that never leave their hometown or follow the playbook and go to college and get the job and get the 2.3 kids and the fucking fence and the house and whatever, you know? To, to put like, it in context, I think you're, you're, you're basically saying, uh, or you're, you're basically pulling the characters of Mary and, and Pippin. Yeah. Like, like, like yeah, the, I could go the guys that are like, like Aragon. Yeah. I have no idea yeah, yeah, what I'm I, doing, yeah. but I want to go. <laughs> yeah, in my head, I'm yeah, yeah, in my head I'm Aragon, the fucking king, but in actuality, I'm Mary or Pippin, where I'm like, that's <laughs> yeah. dope, let's fucking party. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh no, no, yeah. Well yeah, hundred hundred yeah, and I'm not lagging those, right? There's no way it's like I'm really good like Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the bitch of it. Um You know what I probably hold on, Lord of the Rings, what character Am I, in all honesty, that's a tough one. Because again, I, I like want to. I'm not short though. Uh, less the short factor. Gimli's probably the closest thing. Yeah. Because I'm rowdy. What's that? You're Harry Potter. Oh my God! Taylor just came in here and said I'm Harry Potter. I don't. I fucking hate Harry Potter. That's this is why, why he doesn't spice. get video. That's why we don't. That's why Taylor's not allowed to come on the podcast. <laughs> Although he could press one button, pop right. on it, and, and I wouldn't know how to stop Hello. him. In all honesty, right. this is why I hate Harry Potter. My ex-wife used to watch that and go to sleep to it, so, and, and never turn the TV off. So I would wake up to random scenes of Harry Potter. And there's one scene in one movie where it's like plants or this little guy. I don't know. It's the most high-pitched, annoying thing ever. Is it? Um, is it Toby? No, no, no. It wasn't that little fuck. I know that guy because my daughter's now in a Harry Potter. She's like, Dad, Harry Potter's the best. I was like, I can't tell you how wrong you are. And yet, <laughs> she's not ready for Lord of the Rings yet. Like, at no. nine, Lord of the Rings is borderline scarier for her. We yeah. we could possibly do Fellowship. I, I, I Twin Towers, probably not. No, not, um, with, not with Minds of Moria. That's what I'm saying, right? It's not going to work. Nine, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's... it's <laughs> I know. I so I I couldn't get like, my son to watch it because it was too boring, right? Like well, he's like he's like, well, is there going to be any action? And I'm like, it's, dude, that's with Minds of Minds of Moria takes a while to get to. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, here's the other thing. I don't fuck around. I don't watch the three hour theatrical release. I watch the four hour. Give me the good stuff. Yep. That's the other thing. When I go to a military school, I end up watching Lord of the Rings or Band of the Brothers every time. Yeah. Because you don't have Wi Fi. You're, I yep. am back in I am back in the shoe, like nineteen hundred at the latest. Because I, I, I'm not going out to dinner. I get right. free shitty defect food. I am eating it. Right. I know mm -hmm. who I am. Right. So I eat my shitty defect food. I, I'm not in the business of making friends. I'm not going over to the bar because nothing good <laughs> happens at the bar in a military installation. So nope, I am back. I am back at my hooch at nineteen hundred. Shit, shower and shave for the next day. And I don't go to bed till midnight. I got five hours. <laughs> Dude, so I, I watch Band of Brothers and Lord of the Rings. Those are my two go tos. And you don't, again, you don't you need a laptop and a good attitude. Actually, I don't even know. You know what? I don't even think my laptop has a C C D ROM drive on it anymore. So I don't man. I'm, not. God bless. I don't even know what I'm gonna do. Now. Download my I don't phone. Think I know, I watch I watch YouTube crap. I don't want I don't even watch movies anymore. Yeah. I sat down to watch a movie last night, turned on Amazon Prime. I was going to watch The Whale, Brendan Fraser. And then Amazon knows me. They're like, hey, do you want to watch a 96-minute <laughs> documentary on the Spitfires from World War II? Uh, you're damn right <laughs> yeah? I do. Of you're course. damn right I do. You got one on the 24, Hurricanes? 
<laughs> BF 109? Right. I'll, I'll watch them all. Exactly. There we go. The, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the, the Measure Spit 109s. So the Spit, there was 24 versions of the Spitfire from 1936 until 1945. Also, I love English documentaries because uh, there's something about the English. They're not politically correct. They, they yeah. tell it how it is. And they don't and super edit dry shit. sarcasm too. It's super. I, oh, it's so dry. That like this one guy's so like, well. he's like, uh, I didn't take pleasure in killing Nazis. I was good at it, and I guess I kind of enjoyed it. And I was like, okay, like he had to think this through, right? And like, and then it got to a point of like, you know, he was doing a job, and you're 21, and you're not thinking about it, you know. And taking lives was part of the game, and he lost buddies. Like, but like he did it in such a very matter of fact. Americans like to be dramatic about it, you know. But like yeah. I did what I did for my grandmama and apple pie. Like the Brits are like, yeah, it's fuck our those God guys. Country, exactly. <laughs> they're like, that's exactly. They're just like, what, pitter patter. That's Canadians, <laughs> uh, Letter Kenny. They're they're like the cousins. Better, let's get her. Pitter patter. <laughs> let's get at her. Anyways, all right. So basically, what I've learned from this experiment of the one, like before the podcast, you're like, hey, here are the two topics. And I was like, let's go with the first one, not because it was the better of the two, but because I was already committed. Once you said the first, I'm like, yeah, yeah let's do that. And, and you know what's funny? Yeah, please. You know what's funny is I actually think we've been we've been discussing only half of it, right? Like Which when half? we say, so it's it, it how the statistic reads is forty point seven percent veterans feel like a guest in their in our own home, and we've looked at it from a sense of do we do we even want to be there? But the, I, what, I, what I, I don't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but what I what I really think of it is I think the home actually operates better without us. It does. No, 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 oh, no, no. For this right. That's where I think that that really maybe we missed the mark and we need to talk about this part. No, 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 no. Even as you reread it and I thought about my initial thing and I didn't make this point. When I hear home, I'm not thinking about a physical building. I'm not even thinking about the you know, the domicile. I think about the area. I think about like my hometown. I think about the idea that I have this flag that I have to go back to and make sure. No, like, no, I, I don't feel at home. I, I, I'd rather not be there. I want to see what the next adventure is. That's what I, I started going down that path of. Do veterans, and I'll make the argument, veterans do have a predisposition wherein they're, they're, they are they can operate or be their best selves in, in a lot of different arenas right like, I, like, let's I, look at veterans like, i think so even 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 like there's two places veterans operate right garrison and the field and i would say garrison and the field are there two extremes that most people don't live in in their entire lives most people don't live in a garrison environment where everything is dressed right dressed this is the rules this is the standards everyone's watching you don't do 26 and a 25 kind of mindset or the opposite Hey, you're in the field. Pack your bag every night. You don't know where you're gonna. You, you, Bunch of you know, cowboys. Some people, right, right. Bunch of cowboys. Some people can't handle. Where am I gonna sleep at night? Uh, when you're in the military, you don't know where you're shitting next. Like you, like you sleeping. It's like twelve you're, hours from now. I don't you know. You might what have I'm to get a next. little innovative. And it, you know exactly. what's, what's what's funny is like I think there are there are two very distinct types of people. In the in the military, there are the people that love the field and hate yeah. garrison, and then yeah. there are the people that love garrison and absolutely hate the field. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm the former. That that dynamic is really interesting because I'm 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 very much you know I love the field I because it's freedom yeah. right like I oh my god yeah I love the ability to pick where I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking sleep like the, you okay we have a patrol base maybe it's fifty square yards and i look at it and i'm like that's my spot that is my spot no nope, you yep. no you can't sleep there nope, that's that, fucking that's mine. my dirt i picked that that's my I dirt pick that with my fucking eyes right and then there are people out there that like that just just can't right like is this <laughs> is this where we're sleeping is, are, we're, we're, well, we're all sleeping out here like yeah yeah and it's gonna get real yeah. cold tonight <laughs> it's like well, it's like where's my spot uh, wherever there is not somebody else, that's where your can fucking we, spot is. Can Next we question. Tense. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, well, here, here, here's the thing, and and then the soldiers that make it, 
that end up making E9, we call it. I don't think it takes that much skill to make E8. And I say that because I'm about to make E8, and I'm not the cream <laughs> of the crop. I, just, I stuck around long enough, right? Speaking from experience. I, I could argue but, it doesn't take that much skill to make E9. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I actually, I have a former first sergeant who made E9 after a, a relief from cause uh, because that was the appropriate uh, uh, post-deployment award for her. Uh, yeah, so she went from whatever RCOM, MSN, whatever garbage award to relief for cause to Sergeant Major Academy. And those are the facts, Jack. No sometimes, opinion. sometimes Don't hold you, that just, me. you just find the right opportunity and yeah. the army has needs. <laughs> you know what? I went from I went from platoon sergeant to letter of reprimand to kicked out of my company to uh letter of appreciation after deployment. Right, I was not flagged. I passed my PT test. No major, whatever. I got a letter of reprimand uh, to four four NCER to promoted to E seven. So and transferred to the unit that I wanted. So I, it all worked out, right? I became a career counselor. Like, hey, yeah. if you fuck up enough, we'll take you as a career counselor. <laughs> Come on down. And now I talk to people about retention. And actually, I, I had my NCER done for uh, I uh, change of Raider NCER because I now transfer. Now I report to. Um, I report right to HRC. So like I kind of made it, Human Resources Command in the Army. And mm -hmm. my last NCUR, I was second in my battalion on uh, transfer or on reenlisting soldiers, and I, and I only worked half a year um, on on that. So I, I, I handled my business right, like whatever I chose. Yeah. So going back to the the, the the thing I say to make E eight, or I would say to make beyond major, you gotta be good at both. Like I know some really good cats that made captain and major, and they were they were really good at one or the other. Like and, and they could, they did not make lieutenant colonel because they, they they couldn't do both. Now yeah. the careers division not so much. I've seen some people that the problem in careers division there's no true field and it's all garrison. And that's really what I've struggled with is being all garrison is not my strength as mm -hmm. a truck driver. And then we were I was military police, but we we were never L and O. We were. Um, uh, initially mission to do uh, convoy support, so combat type operations, and then got remissioned to detention ops, which was the, the worst. That's how I ended up in Gitmo. Um, hmm. I, I've always appreciated being out in the field, like get in the trucks, and, and then we'll figure it out when we get downrange. Like you're talking about, you know, Fort McCoy this weekend or whatever, going, you know, being an OIC of a, uh, a range. It's like that's the good stuff, not yep. fucking PT drilling ceremony i can do it it's not my thing um or when i was in gitmo they had i was i'd never been active duty and and when i was in gitmo they talked about doing boards and, and the active duty component did it and it's like well this is you know then i heard about board babies never heard about a board baby before but basically someone that can you know wear, wear their dress blues really well go to schools memorize shit and yeah. do really good facing movements in front of ncos and i'm like yeah that's not interesting to me could i do that yeah. probably do i want to absolutely not I'd rather yeah. be in the field and you throw some shit at me and I got to use Sergeant Major Eat sugar cookies to figure this shit out. Right? Like, that's more interesting to me. Right? Like. Oh, my God. Uh, right, 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 like, that's, again, only like, a, I, 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 only I, a few will get that. A hundred percent. I should. I think it's only Army would get that. I don't know if they use that elsewhere. Maybe Marines. We, we talked up. I thought we talked about it at the. Uh, I thought we talked about it on a podcast. I, they might. I I just don't know. Right. So okay. I don't know Sharp, if sorry, sorry, other uh, branches use that that uh, that format. And actually, they changed. No, no. We talked about it on this podcast. Oh, they might, no. Hold on. It might have been my other podcast. No, no, no. It probably. No, no. Actually, I think we. I might have talked about this on the Trash Talk Business Podcast because it's no longer Sergeant Major eats sugar cookies. No, right, now, it's sugar, something else. It's no longer sustainment. Okay, so Sergeant Major eats sugar cookies. Uh, hold on, I, I wrote it down, so I remember. I didn't write it down. I just wrote the S M E S C. All right, let's see how good I am. Right, but geez, this is like uh, P L D C for our old timers, or oh, wow. B L C for the young guys, <laughs> or W L C for people like W L C me. Warrior Leadership Course. W L C. There we yeah. go. Okay, Sergeant Major eats sugar cookies. Situation, mission, execution, sustainment, command and control. Yeah, it's is that right? What well, it, hasn't it, it changed now? I feel like it changed now. It does. So now, now the sugar is no longer sustainment, and it's logistics. Are you googling it or am I googling it? I, I'll I'll Google it. Um. So that's 
all I know, this is what I've learned in all my years of the, the military of Sergeant Major Eat Sugar Cookies, the five paragraph. Or, yeah, now it's eight. Administration logistics. That's stupid. That's for that's, that's for Marines. So now it's Sergeant Major Eats animal crackers. Animal crackers. I just made that up. Situation, mission, execution, administration, logistics, in command and signal. Yeah. yeah, it used to be sustainment, right? Yeah. You're right. This is uh, so five paragraph op order. Hold on. Okay, that's the Marine Corps. Hold on. Where situation, mi- mission, execution, administration, logistics, and commanded signal. Okay, that's the right. Okay, that's okay. So that's that's is that what the Army uses too? So I googled it. And that's what it says the uh, Marine Corps uses. So there you go. Marines know what we do. And CBs. Whatever. Here, here's no, what the I know. S, the S wasn't... Uh, s- s- uh, God. It was service and support, not sustain- sustainment. Back in our day. Service okay. and support. Are you... Are you? Did you know this? Did you Google this? Right? I, because I researchability... Knew it, I, but it, it came back to me. Came back to you. Yep. Uh, what did I say? Sustainment. That was the one I wasn't sure about. I'll be I, honest. Because because when you said it, I was like, that doesn't sound right. But I don't remember. Also, what it was. I did learn this at BL, uh, BNAC. It was the question was uh, train two, right? And you had options, and I wrote down. This is like one of like three questions I got wrong because I made comment on this list. I wrote train to win, and the options were train to win, train to or no train to fight. I think so. It was like train to fight, train to win, train to standard, train to time. I put down train to fight. Apparently, we're trained into standard. So there you go. Little well, uh, some people I don't, train I don't know to if time. Still, well, that is correct. That's not the right answer. I'm telling you. I'm telling you what the book says. Train to standard. I, tra- I, I, I almost positive. I, I worked on train to fight. I might be wrong on the train to win, but I remember it was fight time standard and something else. And I won 100. percent We train to fight. Like, look, what are we doing here? Yeah, it's bullshit. Um. All right, so. How do we get on Sergeant Major Eat Sugar Cookies? I don't know. All right. I also, know. starting well, this is the other thing that's made me successful in life. Starting tentative movement. That was another thing I learned in the military. It's like right, one third, two thirds. Mm-hmm. Uh, if someone's like, "Hey, you know this," when we, well, we were talking about the field in in the field or in Iraq and in, in real world scenarios, when when you get word down, right, a warno, hey, we're about to get a, a, a an order, right? It's, it's, we're about to get a mission. Something's about to happen. Here's the deal. I'm a truck driver. It's like, okay, what do we need? Well, we need our truck. Probably that's a good start, uh, right? Like we need we need uh, the basics, right? Food, ammo, water. Probably need to change of pants. Okay, probably want to throw that on there, right? So it's like that's about the tentative movement, and then you make sure you got fuel in your truck, and you're like, okay, yeah. I'll stay like literally stand by to stand by, and we would just pack our trucks up and stand near our truck. Which yep. was basically this smoking area, halfway between our chews and our trucks. So then you watch people come out of the talk, and you're like, "Oh, something's about to go down, yep. right?" But this idea, and that's the other thing that has has served me well in in the army or in, in the civilian world. Now it's like the the idea of like laying your clothes out the night before, getting mm-hmm. your gear ready the night before. You know, making sure I have all the shit in my truck for tomorrow because weather might happen. I might sleep in. I might hit the snooze. Uh, right. All these things could happen, and if none of them happen, so what? I'm already ready. I got 10 more minutes to sit around. I can scroll Facebook. I can, you know, show up early to things, right? Because I'm not going to wait. Like, you you, you have a lot more control over the day-to-day than a lot of people give themselves credit. Like, oh, I was late because of this, this, and this. It's like, well, no. Right. You, you had all these preventable things you you, don't, you chose you, not to do. You don't have any SOPs. That's, you have that's no SOPs. Right, like that's – it. it that's it. Like, like your yeah. Like how you practice it in your life and how you create the standards of how you live your life is is determined of what you get out of it. Like that's, yep. you know, in the infantry that we live that right. Like we have to, we get that shoved down our throats. Right. If you are not ready to fight, if you are not ready to move, if you are not, if you are the last one, you will get shamed. You will get harassed. You will get all of the shit yeah. from from everybody. And so, like, you you learn to create these standards for yourself that say, I need to be quick. I need to be prepared. And so you start learning, like, I don't want to get yelled at. I don't want to get treated like shit. And so I'm going to have everything packed before everybody. If that means I have to wake up five minutes before everybody 
and be the first alarm that goes off in the night, like I'll mm-hmm. do it and everybody can get the fuck over it because I'm going to be first. Right. And then like, and, and yeah. you build those, those SOPs for yourself and that perspective just becomes like, like this, this natural process of how you do things. Like for me, I always have backpacks. I always do things the night before. I always am, I'm always working to prepare myself for tomorrow. And it's funny that we're talking about like feeling like a guest in your own own home because my wife, it feels like sometimes she actively tries to contradict my, my, my own personal SOPs. Right. I, I would love to have the car always full of gas. But my wife loves to challenge me on that and take it to the extreme and have no gas in the car. And so, like, we always have this, like, this conflict, right? And, and I laugh about cars. it. Right? There, well, there's a solution. Get two cars. We have two cars, but she likes <laughs> no, no, she no. likes the one that I like. And so, <laughs> guess what I have to do? I got to fill up with gas, right? And so, like, that's yeah. – it's that's where that's where I think this statistic is really kind of interesting is that when when we step into our lives and you know for you not having a family or like a like a, a the nuclear family of a wife and yeah. kid you have a kid yep. it's it's to me this feels different because it's I've felt that aspect of coming home and having a wife and a son who operated better and easier and more comfortably without me. And when I Mm. came back, I actually brought with me uh, chaos for them uh, of sorts because I had my standards and I had my practices that meant something to me that mattered to me. And when I brought them into the home, nobody liked it but me. Right. And I had to, I had to look at myself and say, do I want to fight this battle? And it's hard because when you come home from a deployment in which people were trying to kill you and you step into a home, everything matters to you a lot more than it should because it had to over there. It had to, like every decision you make over there was life or death. And when you come home the first two months, it's like you have to retrain yourself to remind yourself that not everybody's trying to kill me here. But that feeling exists and you have to like, you have to actually look at yourself and that's really hard. It, whether it's, yeah. whether you're in a pos- position like where I was, where I, I knew it was coming and I recognized it was coming. And even with that, it was fucking hard to, to look at my family and say, or look at myself and, and my existence with, with my family and say, take a step back. They know what they're doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Does he, you know, does my son need to be ready 15 minutes early? Probably not. Right. He'll be all right. Right. And if he's late for the bus, guess what? I can drop him off. Right. Like, and, and, and change how my feelings exist within the, the nuclear family. That's what this statistic st- told me. It's interesting that mm. it told you something else, but that's what I think a lo- because like I, I saw another statistic, like 58% of veterans are married. Right. And so 58% of veterans might have this recognition of what it means to step back into a nuclear family and say, they do better or, 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 without me. Correct. Or, or here, here's the fucked up stat. Oh, wait, oh you said 58% of veterans are varied. Here, here's, here's a beautiful stat 41 and 58 is 99. So maybe the 41% that don't feel like they're at home are the same 41 that aren't married. <laughs> right. Like we have this perfect. Yeah. The math checks out. Like wow. perfect math. I'm you're the fifty eight percent guy that figured it the fuck out and got married. I'm the forty one percent guy that doesn't feel at home. And I'm good. Like let's fucking go. Well, <laughs> even to that to that end, what you were saying, and this is where I will hundred percent acknowledge I got back home. Um and by home again, this is a very tentative term. I I I was no longer in Gitmo and I was in the United States at my then wife's house in Peoria. And she had looking a system. For, looking like, for a Chick-fil-A. Ch- Chick-fil-A. Chipotle. 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 <laughs> um, Chipotle. I had to Google. I was so mad. I was mad because I was so out of I was so out of it. I just was like, this isn't this isn't my home. I don't fucking live here. Yeah. Anyways, I came in and like that first week is like she was getting our daughter ready and like she took the, our daughter to daycare. And it's like they had a fucking system Process, without me. Yeah. And then I came in and I was like, well, 
your process doesn't include me. So any process that I come in and include myself in fucks up their plan. Yeah. And we did not do a good job of communicating that. Literally, the last conversation we had as a married couple before I'm like, yep, I, I want a divorce was that exact thing. I was fucking up her flow and her plan. And we had a lot of other issues. So it's not like that was the only thing. It was this idea that I didn't feel at home. I was creating the chaos. And also, I came from a very, very controlled environment in Gitmo where every yeah. you can't walk through a door in a facility without three things happening. Right? You have to be seen on the camera. You have to communicate with the person in tower, or in control, rather, to open the door. And they have to press a button just for a door to open. Yeah. So now it's like, oh, hey, welcome to the civilian world where you can do whatever the fuck you want. You know, learn how to pass go. In Gitmo, you didn't need a fucking GPS because there's one road and it takes you to the four places you'd ever go. Right? Like, now as you're in Peoria, Illinois, bumfuck nowhere with corn, and you're like, I don't know how to operate as an adult. Yeah. And, and that fucked me up. On top of a, a piss poor marriage, right? And I was a contributing factor. And that's interesting. So, w my last relationship going down to Chicago, um, she, not going, well, I was going down to Chicago all the time. They had a system, right? She was a single mom, kid played hockey. They had a system that worked for them. And it really didn't work, though, because every time we had to go somewhere, it was the, oh, we're late, we're this, we're that, whatever, because he, he the son, always wanted to be on time for shit and he wanted to be early. And he had, um, Maybe just they both had control things, right? They, they didn't want to be late. And then here's me. I don't give a fuck, right? Because I show up when I arrive. And when I arrive is when I show up, right? Like I'm one of those like whatever. And uh, we, it took me a while because I'm like, well, hold on. Why is a 13-year-old dictating when and how we get in the car? Like what kind of fucked up world are we living in where he has more authority than you, the adult, who pays for the gas, pays for the car, pays for the hockey, pays for the education, let's go down this path, right? And I had to find a way for me to use my talents and abilities, which is, you know, Googling and math, to say, okay, hold on. What time do we need to be there? What time do we need to leave? And up until that point, we're not having any of this anxiety. And I remember it used to drive both of them mad. Like one of the last times I was there, we'll call it noon because it makes simpler math, right? We had to leave at noon to arrive at hockey 45 minutes before the game because he had to be there 45 minutes early. The game was an hour, was like was like 50 minutes away, and I already budgeted 10 minutes for traffic, and we're going west in the middle of the day, so the traffic was nil, right? So I budgeted all this, and it was 11.45, and I was like, all right, I'm going to go hop in the shower. And they were like having aneurysms, because I know in 15 minutes, I will be in the car. And so I like walked downstairs, like wearing my basketball shorts, like, all right, I'm going to go take a shower before we head out. And by the time I came back upstairs to take a shower, I wasn't even having my shoes on yet. They're in my Jeep, car running, packed, ready to go. And I get in, and it's like 11.58. And I go, eh, look at that, two minutes early. And they're both like, ah! and I was like, I said we're leaving at noon. Why are we ha Wait, Why is this a problem? And then he's having a little moment in the back. And I was like, hold on. Math doesn't give a shit about your anxiety. I, I can't tell you how much I don't care. And then we had a little coming to Jesus moment where I'm like, hey, you're 13, right? Like, how about, hey, thanks for the ride. Hey, thanks, Mom, for paying for hockey. Hey, thanks for coming to all my games. Why don't we, a little gratitude, right? And it was so empowering to me and her, and she had to learn that over time. Like, it's like, well, no, when you plan accordingly, you can avoid saying, okay, traffic, fine. Oh, we need, like, to your point, fuel, right? Like, I get twitchy if I don't have the right amount of fuel to get to the thing I have to get to because right. th that th there's the meme about it, right? The lie that you tell yourselves you're going to get gas in the morning before work is the worst lie, right? It like, sucks, yeah. It sucks. Thankfully, I have yep. a gas station three blocks from me that I pretty much have to drive past wherever I go so it, it works out well. Um, but it's like in, in that regard, me, me being able to plan shit out, it's like you can break things down to reduce all this anxiety because in the military, if you have anxiety, you will fail in the military. There is so much ambiguity in the military. And it's like they beat the anxiety out of you in basic training. Because the much. drill sergeant comes in and starts throwing stuff and screaming. You could be doing everything right and somehow you're wrong. right? And it's because in war and in life, shit happens. Yeah. If, if you talk to the most elite soldiers, and I've had the opportunity to talk to some, it's like they go through so many battle drills and so many scenarios it's not that the world slows down. Seconds tick at the same speed for everybody else. And yet, their world slows down. 
because it's not the first time they're seeing this stimulus. They've planned for it. They've rehearsed it. They, you know, this isn't like, oh, we're just rehearsed. Like, they build the rooms of the buildings they're about to assault so they can rehearse every potential scenario so when something happens, they respond to it. Yeah. it they don't it even becomes, react. They respond. It becomes a, a, a risk percentage, right? Like, what's, what's the most high-risk thing? Yeah. We're not doing that, right? And, and so they... Yeah. The, I think the idea of like when, especially infantry, how I look at tactical decisions and I like my tactical decisions as a sniper section leader are profoundly important, right? Because if I send three people into the wrong space, they're dead, right? A, a sniper team is, mm. is, it may be a very lethal thing when it's sitting in, in place and ready to shoot, but it's a very non-lethal thing when it's moving. Right, the, these yeah. guys are carrying massive weapons, uh, not not fast weapons. Uh, they may be really accurate, but only when they're in position. So, like, if I make the wrong tactical tactical decision, these guys are dead. So, like, when I look at tactical decisions, and at this point, it's every decision. I look at like, what's my risk factor? What is the what is the least likely avenue of approach that's going to be an issue? Right, and I'm going to send him that way, and I'm going to create this uh, this understanding of the scenario at play, and try to figure out: is this high risk? Is this low risk? Is like what is what are the chances of someone walking down this road at 12 o'clock at night, uh, so that we can cross it? You know, and and that carries over into life of like, uh, what's the most what's the most risky thing that is going to happen here? What is the worst possible thing i don't even need to think about it because i can think of what's the least pro problematic thing and do that I, mm -hmm. and you focus your decisions on risk rather than on um the the highest priority of failure right because we're okay with like limited failure if we can react to it and we can create the the response to it um but what you know what i think people that aren't in the military and even maybe people that are focused on garrison often think about is worst case scenario ends the mission. Whereas yep. for for us, worst case scenario doesn't necessarily end the mission. It just changes our response to it. And well, that's I, I think I I made this joke. I've been using this joke lately. It's like uh, you go talk to the, you know the, your garrison example, right? You go talk to an academic about a problem and how to solve it. They'll tell you all the ways that it's not going to work and all the risk, right? You go talk to a redneck about a problem. He's already come up with three different ways that he can solve it without even without yeah. a without an inkling if it'll work, right? Because it's this right. idea, right? And that's the difference between garrison and field. It's like garrison's job is to poke holes and everything. Field's job is to figure it the fuck out. And that's why I love the field environment, right? And there's a place in the military because we, we do have to do both. Right, there is a time and place, right? And, and the garrison is more strategy, and the, the field is more tactical. And I'm a doer, and I, right, I, I, and and because of that, I strive in the field. And that's why even here in the civilian world, it's like I strive when things are chaotic. Like I, I, I prefer it. Yeah. Like, and, and and I don't like overtly prefer it. Like, hey, let's go fuck things up. When I look back at my life at my happiest times, it's when things were the most messed up with with myself or the people around me because it's that intentionality among the chaos to me chaos is interesting yeah like this idea of the same shit every day is so not interesting to me it's why i own a business that's why we started this podcast it's why i wrote a book it's like oh that sounds interesting and then i go do it and i either succeed or i learn well i, I learn either way i suppose i succeed or i fail and i learn either way and that's pretty fucking dope and so this stat of like 41% of people don't feel at home in their, or what was it, don't feel, was it at home? Feel what like a exact? guest in their own home. They feel like a guest in their home. Like, I, right, I feel like a guest wherever I am because I'm antsy to get to the next place. Like, that's mm. what I'm excited about. I mean, th th this weekend I sat around Friday night and went and played spades with uh, a bunch of army buddies. Saturday night I played uh, cribbage and went to a barbecue with one of my buddies who, was, who his wife was out of town, so he had the boys over, you know? And it's like, Cool, and then I and I come back to my own domicile, and I'm just like, all right, what's the next adventure? I feel most at home when I am by myself traveling. Because what's, what's I, interesting I, is is you've you've created the solution for yourself as 
I'm comfortable being a guest. I, oh, I'm I, I'm good. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I'm, I'm in, I'm out. And also, here's a beautiful thing. When I'm not welcome in places, when it's not the right room for me, I'm good with it. Yeah. A lot of people will be like, oh, good, yeah, no. I, and, and that is a learned thing. It wasn't like yeah. I had this, you know, invincible shield around me where I'm like, your words don't hurt me. No, it's like, oh, okay, I'm not welcome here. Fine, I'm going to stop showing up here. And then what magically happens when you stop talking to certain people and stop showing up to certain places, problems stop showing up and creeping on you. Yeah. I noticed that actually I, I, um, I quit drinking a month ago, quietly and unannounced because I didn't realize I did it. Um, ever since we had our very first episode of the podcast, mm-hmm. I really considered alcohol. I listened to stuff that Jordan Peterson was talking about, uh, uh, Theo Vaughn was talking about, Joe Rogan, like people I look up to, and they've all pretty much stopped drinking. There's also this neuroscientist, Andrew something or another, who I watch a lot of his content, and I stopped drinking. Well, here's what's interesting. I did not go out St. Patty's Day night. I went out, so that was the last weekend I, I drank. I um, That Friday night, I went out and had two beers after a CEO roundtable. That was Friday night. And normally St. Patty's, is that, that's my day. I put on my kilt. I get fucking hammered. Great Facebook posts. It's a good night. I didn't go out that night. And what I realized is nobody called me, nobody texted me. And that was, I'm good with that. Because the world went on without me. And I didn't do anything that I, I questioned. And then actually that weekend, that, that Saturday night, I went out and had a couple of beers with my buddy playing cards. And then Sunday night, we had a, a memorial service for the guy that passed away in our company. And I had a couple of beers with our guys. Oh, no, I didn't know. I did not drink that night. That was the night. I didn't drink that night because I didn't want to drink after that. Like, that was not, my brain was like, nope, this is not a good reason. Or, right. So the last time I had a beer was a random two Miller Lights, three Miller Lights, what it was, playing cribbage where I didn't even want to drink. I was, I happened to be at the bar because I didn't want to be at home, you know? And so for me, it's like, even in that context, I realized it wasn't serving me. It isn't serving me. And I'm not like, I'm not going to AA. I'm not talking even about sobriety. I don't really care what other people do. And maybe tomorrow I have a beer because I, I have one, right? But what, what I realize is like, I can build a life around some of these principles and I reduce the amount of variables in my life. And I'm good with that. Yeah. Because for years, I felt like I had to fit in. I felt like I had to do these things to check the box. And when I realized, especially the last two or three years in conversations with you and my other podcasts and reading a bo- or writing a book and reading books for that matter, it's like, when I'm at peace with Andy, all those other things are so less significant. Yeah. Where I live. I mean, I live in my warehouse now. Fine. My house will get done when it gets done. Like June, July, whatever. I'll go. I'll, it'll be my house. Right? And feeling like a guest is fine. Because that means that I, there's something else. Right? I never get to that point where I'm comfortable. Because my fear is getting to a point where I, I am complacent. Right? And complacency kills. And I've been there where it's like, well, this is good enough where I'm never going to get better or I'm never going to be better than I am today. It's like, fuck that. Like, I want more every day. And I'm good with that. And if that means I got to go far and wide, where's my goddamn plane ticket? And that's now my strength, right? We, we talk about the military. In the military, we have 24 character strengths, we have no weaknesses, we have strengths. And that was a that was a, a mindset shift I have to have. So it's like some people say, "Well, you're divorced and you're a single dad, and uh, you know you don't you don't even have a house to live in right now, right?" It's like, well, okay, that means I don't have constraints. Mm. I got more time and energy and love. I have an abundance of all these things to give to other people. That's the mindset shift that veterans need to have. I will make that argument. We need to have that. When we come home, there are some amazing things and skills and abilities that we have, and we have to figure out how do we build a life around our strengths without letting the rest of the world remind us of what they consider to be weaknesses. I don't have any weaknesses. Andy has no weaknesses. He has strengths, and he has things that aren't strengths. And I choose what I'm going to work on, and I choose the positions I'm going to put myself in to be successful. And when I do that, I choose my destiny. I choose the life I want to live. And that's what a victor says versus a victim. And I was a victim for a long goddamn time. And I pissed away a lot of energy in time being a victim of my own circumstance being, versus being a victor of my story. That's the message of this podcast. There are resources and there are people. And we will tell stories and we'll tell the times that we failed. Ultimately, you have to be the 
you have to choose to transform into this veteran. And what does that look like? That's a choice. Yeah. I wrote a poem that uh, kind of emphasizes that understanding of of being a victim, or at least discusses it. It was pretty... It's... Can you share that with us? Yeah, I could probably do that. Pull it up. Let's, let's, let's end on that note, because we started this podcast... I'll fill the time. This is a time filler. A little trick. A little trick we learned here in the podcast world. You yeah. see your co-host googling something. You fill. You fill the dead air, right? We don't have any sponsors to mention. No uh, <laughs> plugs. No mentions. And and but and this is what's interesting. This is what I like about this podcast and conversations that you and I have. It's like, hey, let's take this one stat and talk about it for an hour. This is be. This is my therapy, right? I I, I challenge everybody out there that there are listeners, and we're starting to gain some listenership. Fifteen episodes. Uh, we've got about 10 released so far. We're starting to get some listenership, which is awesome, and starting to get some feedback from people, which was excellent because we do this, I do this selfishly for me because it's therapeutic, and I also do it because I, I want to be the mentor to others that I wish I would have had, yeah. right? And because I can't go back in time, and now it gives me the opportunity to give the answers that I have found on my journey and solicit feedback from others that have gone through similar and hear their journey and their story because I learned along the way and I can share that knowledge, mine and theirs, with the rest of the world. And so what I loved about this is you started with a stat and we saw it from different two different ways. We spent, you know, an hour and ten minutes now talking about one stat. That's all it was. It wasn't yeah. even a question. It wasn't an argument. It was a stat. And we go on these little journeys and, and this is I this is how I learn, right? I'm a, I'm a kinesthetic learner and and I learn in real time. I learn by figuring out. And so talking things through and understanding them and sharing my journey, that's where the ideas spark. And, and now in reflect, this is my reflection. Like uh, I get to share my reflection with the audience and the audience gets to see me in real time, kind of figure out my own shit. Yeah. Versus the, 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 the Facebook and the LinkedIn highlights of my life shit. Like this is the good stuff. Yeah. This is you know, as when, real as it gets. When we know there's been a couple of weeks when we didn't do this podcast for whatever reason. When I don't do this podcast, I I, I don't take that hour to invest. Yeah. You know, and so even last week, it's like hell or high water. We I literally called the guy in 20 minutes before the podcast, like, hey, can you co host a podcast? And we figured it out. Like, that's again, that's a total fucking the Navy guy, too, of all people. But, you know, that's that's the way we do things in the military. It's like, yeah. sure, I got nothing to do. And if I did, it ain't that important. Like, let's go. <laughs> anyway. All right, did you find the poem? I did. So some context. All right, let's get to it. Some context about this is uh, titles called Wisdom Learned. Um, and I wrote this. God, I woke up at four in the morning and I just felt this spark of inspiration. So I wrote it in bed for my kids uh, with my daughter kind of sleeping uh, just right over on the other side of the room. So it's a it's a deeper one for me. I fear the fight ahead of you, a future that is bleak and blue. I watch your light grow and glow, knowing someday it may cease to show. The world is a dreadful place, as our lives are a meaningless race. A race to wealth and power that forgets the very hour. The single hour of empathy we have to hold our family. Each day we rise and grind anew and fall into the revenue, shamed and guilted into plunder. Have we done it right, I wonder? To read beyond this lonely sentence is to question your life's attendance. Were we meant to be the machine or please a God so cold and mean? Are we here to do the bidding of thankless souls who go on winning? Are we supposed to give our body for a love that is painful and so shoddy? No soul, no love, no connection shows up in our reflection when we dig our graves in agony and live our lives absently. Come home today and see the riches that you possess and that which is the purest gold and wealth renown, you, your love, and family now are the greatest gift around. Remember that you are so bound to be yourself, to work yet pleasure, to live in love and be together. The world will always be so blue unless you allow you to see the hue, the hue that sheds a light on the darkness within the night. Darkness is a painful season, though there are many a reason why a soul might fall to treason. You decide what is unreasoned. The heart and mind are not two, for they are meant to be just one. Fight for you instead of two, and never let your life be done. 
Fight for the right you possess and don't let pain and mess define your distance and direction. Guide yourself into connection and build yourself a mighty perspective that is calm and yet reflective, that sees the beauty and the beast and limits self-contempt at least. Do not, do not despair for you are there for yourself when none do care. Do not fear your ignorance, fear the potential for arrogance, for one can learn and one cannot. Do not climb up above the lot and shout out sullen blame and hate or spiteful victimhood will be your fate. Do be wary, but not too much. Take the risk and give your touch. For love is worth the pain and gain, as wisdom learned is never in vain. Hmm. That was good. I appreciate it. Send, send me that. I got to read that. I got to read that again. I will. Maybe more than once. I can, uh, I'll send it to Taylor so he can put it in the show notes if he wants. Yeah, put that in the show notes. Uh, that'll be good. And that's, and that's, I, I first of all, want to say thank you for sharing. I had so many ideas that just got sparked. And the fact that, you know, you, you wrote it in a vulnerable time and you, and you wrote it, right? You're willing to share it with the world, right? Not, you didn't just like jot it down and then dismiss it. And then you took the time to really write it and then also share it with the world. Mm -hmm. Like that's ultimately, um, the message behind this podcast and the message that we as um, veterans, as men, and as humans need to uh, adhere to, you know, especially, you know, we live in a society now where um, there's these certain expectations of what men are or aren't and veterans are or aren't and people are or aren't, right? And ultimately, we are our best selves when we are open and honest with ourselves and those around us. When we are transparent about our journey, and because what we end up doing is we create a culture in which people are uh, unapologetic about them and their journey, right? There's 8 billion people in this world with a unique perspective. And when you share the perspectives, not only does it educate people, it also opens up and allows people and, and gives them the permission in some ways to let their time and talent or their, their talents and abilities shine through. Um, so I appreciate that. I, I, you've done, you've read poetry or showed me poetry in the past that I've I've appreciated, and um, you know that's that's the message of this podcast for the veterans and non-veterans alike. Ultimately, figure out who you are, determine the life that you want to live, and then go out and do it. Take the wisdom learned, like you talk about. Right? It's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows. It's going to be black and blue. Take the lessons learned. Take the lessons learned from others. Don't be so proud. That you're 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 not willing to learn from others. Don't don't be so proud where you think that the stats aren't going to hit you. You know, fifty percent of veterans get divorced or whatever. We've read that stat in the you know in the recent past, right? Fifty or over fifty percent of veterans get divorced, and and also embrace it. If if you're one of the forty point seven that feel like a guest in your own house, okay, how do you use that to your advantage? Right? How do you how do you build a life out of that? And also, how do you acknowledge that? If you don't want to be part of that stat, what do you need to do? Mm -hmm. The world, your family, your kids, your friends, your employer, it's not for them to figure out. It's ultimately on, on you. That That is your responsibility as the victor of your story. And so that's, that's what I'm taking away from this podcast. We started with a stat. We ended with a poem. And it all comes down to the same thing. It's ultimately on you, the individual, to to write the story that you want to write by the thoughts you have and the actions you take every day. Yeah. You know, it always it always brings me back to that first episode when when Donnie was on talking about mm -hmm. um when he talked about dancing, it it just was so relatable to poetry for me. That yeah, you know, like and I I had been at that point, I had already posted a bunch of poetry on, on TikTok of some of the poems that I had really like grown up and, and had helped me kind of find myself. Um, but I think it was around that time when I was actually starting to write more of my own. I just hadn't posted a lot. Um, and poems like this, uh, when, I, when I write them now, I, I start thinking like, yeah, I'm just going to post it because it's me right like and if nobody likes it that's fine i i wrote it because i needed to um 
and I I, I want to go back to that stat, and and maybe this can be the takeaway, and, and we can call it a day. But if you feel like a guest in your own home, uh, I I don't think you should underestimate the the profound nature of what your identity has has made you feel. Um, if you feel like your identity needs to be in control of the home, maybe that needs to change. Maybe that needs to be adjusted because maybe you seeing other people in control and, and seeing that, that dynamic work really well, um, maybe you need to adjust your identity and really conform to a, a side of you that you haven't seen before or allow a side of you to exist within that moment that doesn't require you to feel like you're not worthy of being in that home because other people are are able to to make everything work um sometimes you just need to exist in a place and and try to find your place in it not look at it and say i don't belong here i'm a guest in this home um but rather how can i help here how can i support here and and learn a little bit about yourself where uh, other people are actually good at something that you may not be um, that's what i think building a family really requires it's not control it's it's honestly more sacrifice and compromise than anything um, mm -hmm. and you know you might be a guest in your home for a little bit until you learn your place in it but don't ever let your identity uh, say that you're not worthy of of living because you are a guest in a place where you thought you'd belong. That's that's my biggest, you know, that's one of the reasons I write poems like this is I want people to know that just because you don't belong in a place doesn't mean you belong in the ground. You know, keep going. Don't give up and move forward. Yeah, as you as you go through this transformational period, f find your place. If you can't find it, build it. Yep. And build it within. And and when you're comfortable with yourself, and I use the word comfortable, right? And you're content with what you have, you can start to live the life you want. Yeah. And and if you're not sure, you gotta get in the reps. You gotta do things different. If whatever you're doing right now isn't working. Do something different. Be honest and transparent with yourself and your loved ones to create an environment, a home, there you where you don't feel like a guest, where you are at peace. Because when you when you don't have a place of refuge, when you don't have a place where you can let your guard down, you you're you're, you're going to add stress and anxiety onto a, a life that's already pretty stressful, and and you know ambiguous. So, it's on you. It's your transformation, um, and and you get to be the victor in your story when you put in the work and you put in the time, and 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 this podcast counselors, therapists, whatever you want to call them, family members, reach out, take the time to to work through what you're going through with others. That's that's my takeaway. And we were all over the place today. And it's jovial. And it's interesting. And I know that I'm in this place now and I wasn't for a long time because I wasn't right with me. Now that I'm right with me and I can see on the other side, um, life is much better. So for all of our listeners, I thank you for joining us on this journey. We look forward to uh, having you on or you know, having more of these journeys with you. And we'd love to have you on the podcast at some point. So if you'd like to be featured on the podcast, talk to us about the transformation you went through, the lessons learned, so you can give back to the veteran community and the civilian members that want to support the veteran community. We'd love to have you on. Uh, you can find us at welcomehometroops.us at our website. Uh, from right from there, you can go and apply to be a speaker, and we'd love to have you on. For Dylan, I'm Andy. Welcome home.